in the profession we are in, dealing with people who have sexual trauma and dealing with sexual addiction, we can make a difference. And I'm 73 years old and have been in the helping profession most of my life, certainly, first in ministry, and then since 1970, full-time as a psychologist, therapist, and about 85% of my practice has been dealing with sexual issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so since Dr. Patrick Carnes wrote uh, what was then called the sexual addiction, started at that point, right. where probably 75 to 80% of what I deal with and what we deal with at PCS is, is sexual addiction. And uh, what I find really meaningful is that I'm one part of 18 therapists, so I get to do the part that I enjoy the most and, uh, and see, see people really make changes in their lives mm -hmm. in significant ways. Well, we use the term at, at PCS about intimacy, able, and disabled. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, well, I'm thinking of a book I wrote called Lonely All the Time because at the, the underneath, what, I, what we do see is an enormous loneliness on the part of people who mm -hmm. haven't um, learned how to relate in a way that's comfortable in terms of feeling connected. So the lack of connectedness, feeling like, wow, it's, uh, I'm not sure that ever in my life I'll ever really get connected. So whatever the reasons are in terms of maybe abuse of one kind or another when much younger, to help people through uh, what we look at as trauma reduction, through genograms, through trauma eggs, through psychodrama, through emotionally focused therapy, uh, the tools that we now have that mm -hmm. seems like as we get smarter at being able to help people to know how to connect to their own hearts and somebody else's heart, how helpful that can be and, and uh, what does excite me and prevents burnout for, for somebody <laughs> do, doing it as long as I've had is that yeah. it just actually like the payoff is when uh, maybe it's an individual or a couple or family. I, my, I was, my dissertation was family therapy and I love, my favorite thing to do is family therapy mm -hmm. and, to, and to see healing occur uh, sometimes in families which have actually caused so much dysfunction for some of the family who are there to begin to feel like there is hope, uh, we can do this differently as a family, mm -hmm. and uh, sins of one generation not being passed on to the other, so that's the kind of thing that, that I thoroughly still love doing. Great. What do you think families need to hear first? Well, I, I, I love the word hope, mm -hmm. that, that you can, we can actually change. Uh, because I think when saying, well, my, in the genogram, they'll say, well, geez, it goes back my, my dad's dad or maybe and my dad and now me. Uh, and it just looks like a cyclical thing that I, I think, I, I don't actually believe that based on our history, and certainly in my history, that I can make the kind of changes. And so at times, Bill, somebody will ask, ask that. In fact, frequently, do you actually believe mm -hmm. that you can help? Not can Ralph help, can we in our field mm -hmm. do something that can make a difference and to be able to say, yeah, we, that we can. And it's nothing magical. And mm -hmm. it does require, uh, I look at it, a partnership with therapist and the client, mm -hmm. that if you do your part and I do mine, then we, we can actually make some progress and begin to see right. things be different. A therapist really joining with a patient mm -hmm. so that a patient or client understands that there is caring involved as well as information. I know that when, I'm, when I went for therapy, mm -hmm. uh, I remember three different types of therapists. One was a therapist I saw who was right on in terms of what I needed to change, mm -hmm. but I didn't experience any kind of connection with me, so mm -hmm. my attitude was, okay, screw you, and <laughs> I never went back, uh, even though he was right wrong. on. And then I remember seeing a couple of therapists who, who really cared for me, however, they didn't confront Mm -hmm. some things I needed to have confronted and so I felt like we developed this deeper friendship but it wasn't going to get me down the road right. and uh, and uh, a friend of mine David Augsburger came up with a term that I love care fronting so mm -hmm. when I've been as a client when I've been with a therapist who whom I believe really did care for me and confronted some things which there mm -hmm. always were things and still are at times mm -hmm. that need to be confronted and that was the person that helped the most so in our setup, I, I always hope that I and others at PCS do both, that the mm -hmm. message that comes across is we, we really, we are here because we do want to be of value in making a difference in your life, and we are going to say it like it is mm -hmm. if we are concerned about something as opposed to like be 
codependent to our own patients. Right. So support and accountability. Are yes, kind of support and accountability. But I literally will ask, the, ask people to talk about what they don't want to talk about. And uh, I've met, I mentioned the confidentiality, the mm -hmm. rules that they've already signed, but that, that I believe that the most helpful thing you can do would be to talk about what you most don't want us to know. That was true in my life when I was a client, and, and frequently, literally every week, somebody will pick up on that and say, okay, you said, we'll point over, right. you said, yeah. talk about what I don't want to talk about, and, and I need to do that. And maybe it's been triggered because somebody else had so shared something that they didn't think anybody else would do, sure. but just a reduction, and it comes from just being open in the area of sharing with the group. And then in, in our profession, what we call Full disclosure, when, when people, guys who are sex addict or women, tell their story for the very first time and really get beyond the dribbling it out stage and really clinch the deal, the enormous shame reduction that can come sometimes first with a the therapist mm -hmm. uh, and then with a the spouse and in our case, and as is true in the field, we frequently, with age appropriate, will then have that kind of thing happen with an entire family. Mm -hmm. And to, to know that nobody in my family uh, is uh, saying, okay, you know, you're out of here, we don't mm -hmm. want you in our family. I, I've, I've been surprised, actually, over the years that we've never had, uh, within the family, somebody drumming out a member of the family mm -hmm. because a person was honest about dastardly deeds and horrible things they've done. Great. Um, what would you say to somebody looking for a therapist? I believe that uh, talking to somebody that you trust, uh, maybe it's somebody who you know has gone to therapy, mm -hmm. and saying, "Hey, who did you see, and for what reasons, and who do you recommend?" Uh, I think that sometimes uh, I know that still about 42 percent of people go to clergy and ask, and sometimes clergy of various faiths can be a good resource mm -hmm. uh, if it's in the uh, sexual area. Uh, maybe someone who is respected, who maybe it's an OBGYN mm -hmm. or, or a gynecologist that, or somebody that can, who knows the community right. and is able to say, well, I've referred, I've used these people, but I, I think it's real important mm -hmm. to check out and find right. out some. And sometimes going and contacting, like in our case, and this so, association to look at the SASH website mm -hmm. and nothing wrong in calling and maybe a executive director Robin Cato or somebody else and say okay you know I'm wondering about I live here who do you recommend mm -hmm. but at least checking things out and maybe talking to two or three therapists instead of just one right no I agree with that very much so mm -hmm. as, as you know I'm an ordained minister and haven't had a church since 1970 mm -hmm. I've stayed ordained because I, 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 I like that's a word that means a lot to me so I look at what I do and we do as ministry yeah. to be able to to minister in a, in a subspecialty where there is as much pain as in the sexual world and then in, within the sexual world to deal with sex addicts and sex offenders is just incredible uh, to, to be trusted to, for people to open up and tell the stories that are, that are the most difficult things to share and then to be able to, to be helpful to people that have that much shame or that much pain and to look at how they can do their life differently. It's a real, I look at it as a real blessing, a real gift. So how do you um, think about spirituality and sexuality? How do they, how do they work with each other and complement? Well, I, I don't know a, a more um, sexual, spiritual experience than, than just to be as intimacy able as I know how to be with my wife. And so in that relationship where it, it is, a good thing to have sexual expression, the physical intercourse part of it. Uh, and then with the spirituality part, I frequently in group therapy will we'll just the experience of people sharing their stories um, will feel like I'm in a much more spiritual experience than frequently in, in attending church someplace. So when you say spiritual, you're talking about connection. connectedness, 
honesty. Uh, I, I was fortunate that, the, that my professor, when I was working on my PhD in the late 60s, said 12-step groups are more like the early church than most churches, told us then. I, I fully understand that, and, and maybe there wouldn't be such a need for group therapy <laughs> if the church community, of all faiths, were, were places where people could feel safe. But the, the highest, highest thing that I think anybody ever tells us or tells me and to us in the field is wow this is just a safe place mm -hmm. to and I've never in some cases never ever felt safe before right. to say what I need to get said and to find out that they're that they're right mm -hmm. that it is safe that kind so of trust that, that mix of safety accountability honesty intimacy uh, and connectedness yeah that defines for me spirituality I'm a minister that doesn't that actually doesn't know if there's a God or not. I make that leap of faith, mm -hmm. a Kierkegaardian turn, and I choose to do that, and, and part, part of it, because it worked for me. Yeah. It's very meaningful, but, but what, I, what I know is that the richness of, of listening to stories and being a part of it, I think, wow, uh, here I am being paid mm -hmm. they're, while they're telling their stories, but, but the incredible gift that, that I get out of that kind of candor and and in our setup every week I hear new stories because every week we have new people coming in and I think wow it's in fact I I'll frequently want to, I love vacations and I'll think on Monday night because the first group I'm involved in is Tuesday morning oh, I don't want to go back I don't want to go back to work and literally within five or ten maybe the most 15 minutes of that process I think wow this is you know I don't I don't know any place I'd rather be the field of sex addiction is what I call coming of age. Mm -hmm. That I, it's exciting to me to see more understanding, to see more respect. I'm hoping that there will be people who, um, like Betty Ford did in the in the alcohol world. Uh, I'm hoping there are folks who find recovery in sexual addiction, where where it is in their best interest to tell their story. Who have some who have the kind of recognition that that. You know, when they say, wow, I, you know, I, I, this is a problem that I had, I got help, you, you know, you can get help, that's, that's just something that I believe that we haven't had enough of, that I'm, I'm looking forward to, I hope before I die, <laughs> that I'm able to experience, you know, that, that kind of breakthrough in, in the sex addiction recovery world.